In this video, I'm following up on a test from a few days ago where I pitted the top of the line M3 Max against my outgoing M1 Pro. To no one's surprise, the M3 Mac was much, much faster, to the point where I personally consider it to be an acceptable machine for AI workloads using Stable Diffusion and Llama-based LLMs. The only problem is that 4,000 US before taxes, that machine presents two main problems. First, that's a lot of money. And second, for AI and 3D work, you can build a PC with dedicated GPU that's not just faster, but several times faster. In other words, the top of the line Mac model, in my humble opinion, is not a very good value proposition. And so that's why in today's video, I'm going to be bringing us back down to earth and looking at machines that are $900 and $1,600 or less expensive, respectively. The base M3 Max with 14 core CPU and 30 core GPU, and the top spec M3 Pro with a 12 core CPU and 18 core GPU. The two questions we're going to answer are what type of real world performance you'll get from these machines, and second, do you actually need the top spec M3 Max machine? So like the previous video, let's start with chat. Now, as noted in the last video, chat using Llama models is a bit strange right now, mostly because the answers generated between the M1 and later models differed in a really significant way. Namely, the M1 generates shorter answers for text-based prompts, but then for Mistral 7B Instruct, basically a model trained on coding questions, it repeatedly generated more practical and usable code samples. So for example, create a JavaScript program that bounces a ball in an HTML canvas element, the M1 created a full HTML page, the M3 is just the JavaScript. It's really odd. Now that said, the previous conclusions from the last video still stand. The M3s start generating a response instantaneously, whereas the M1 takes a beat or two. Despite that, as the M3s tend to generate longer responses, all machines finished in around the same time. Okay, let's talk image generation. So here the newer machines make a much better impression, but before I give the exact numbers, let me make a quick analogy. My M1 Mac is to stable diffusion as dial-up was to the internet. The M3s are more like early broadband. So I think of the stable fusion as like a search engine. You typically don't get the best results straight away, so the faster you can query, the better your experience. So bottom line, for 512 by 512 images, the M1 took 40 seconds, the M3 Pro 10, the M3 Max I have here 6, and the top of the line Max 4. In practice, all M3s feel fast enough. Of course, it has to be said my RTX 3080 equipped PC, one second using the custom Tensor cores. Now this disparity is what I mean when I say the top end model it just doesn't make me feel like it's a great value. For far less, you could just build a PC and be done with it. Still, Apple is making good progress in this area, and who knows, software tweaks could extract further performance. Okay, let's talk 3D via Blender 4. So this is definitely a case where the hardware ray tracing in the M3s is immediately felt. This means a good 2x speed up over previous generations right off the top. Now the kicker here is something I noted in the last video, which is the denoiser capabilities in Blender are fantastic. It does such a good job, in fact, that in most cases you can have or even quarter your sample count with almost no loss in quality. As samples are one of the biggest influences on speed, roughly speaking, half the samples means half the render time. Now even despite that, the rub here is my M1 was so slow that even when you reduced your sample count to half, of what the M3 is used, it was still four times slower. So yeah, the hardware ray tracing in the M3 is the real deal. So focusing on just the M3s then, one interesting thing I found was the ray tracing cores seem to scale non-linearly. That is, the M3 Max with its 30 core GPU rendered tugboat in 34 seconds, whereas the M3 Pro with 18 cores, 56. Now this pattern repeated in just about every scene I tested, where the Max was typically two times faster than the Pro, sometimes more. Now I should quick note the same difference was found with the EV rendering engine, and even in more demanding renders, neither of the M3's fans became audible. In short, the M3 is a huge win for ray tracing, and even more so with the Max variants. So to finish things up, I wanted to have some fun and talk gaming. Now, to be clear, you should not buy these machines for gaming. It just happens to be that the hardware is now good enough in the laptop form factor that, well, not only is it possible, in some cases it's actually quite good. 
For gaming, the headline then is this. The Max in its 14-inch form factor pumps out some impressive performance, but it comes at the cost of an aggressive fan. This machine runs hot and loud. Now that said, if we lower resolutions to say 1920 by 1080, the Max's fans rarely turn on. On the flip side, the M3 Pro runs cooler and as a consequence, usually much quieter. Now let's talk specifics, starting with Resident Evil Village. Now both machines are capable of locked 60 Hz at non-native resolutions, for example, 2560 by 1440. But the Max has a much easier time of locking to 60 frames per second, and in some cases that magical 120 Hz, which is the display's native refresh rate. Now, speaking to the thermal challenges noted a moment ago, when we set Resident Evil to a 120 Hz refresh rate, the max locks to 120 frames per second while drawing in 30 watts, the Pro 81 frames per second while drawing in 21 watts. Now, unfortunately, that extra 10 watts sends the max into a bit of a head spin and the fans really ramp up. However, and somewhat surprisingly, locking to 60 Hz actually flips the results. Now the Max actually draws less power by a watt or so. More importantly, at this easier to drive refresh rate, both machines locked to 60 frames per second and were effectively silent. Now I bring up this power thing because if you want to take this machine on say a three hour plane flight, every bit of efficiency helps. If you keep the performance level comparable between the two machines, the Max actually sips a bit less power but on the other hand, if you crank up the settings, the Max takes in much more. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, moving on to Baldur's Gate 3. At high settings using FSR at native resolution, the Pro averages 34 frames per second in the Max 70. Turning down the resolution to 1512 by 982 bumped us up to 50 on the Pro and 99 on the Max. I suppose the key takeaway here is the Max once again allows us to get that fantastic clean image that locks to 60 frames per second, whereas to lock to 60 on the Pro requires some pretty significant image quality sacrifices. Finally, I tested Liza P. At medium settings native resolution, the Pro clocked in at 30 frames per second. The Max once again doubles that to around 60. So there we have it. For AI work, the Max is faster, but not shockingly so, though just enough to make repeated image generations a more satisfying experience. For 3D, honestly, I'd say it's not even close. The Max is literally twice as fast. And for gaming, both perform quite well, but the Max more so, generally delivering smooth gameplay, though at the expense of more fan noise at higher resolutions. Overall, I think both machines are great, but if you can stretch for the Max, I think it's a market improvement over the Pro. Finally, to answer the question I posed at the start of this video, do you need the top of the line Max chip? If you only live in a world with Max and your job is 3D, I'd say yes. Rendering times are still around 20% faster than the lower end Max chips, and those savings will pay for themselves. For everyone else though, I'd say the base Max chip is plenty fast and saves you a good bit of money.